wallpaper, so ordinary, so trivial, it might seem barely worth talking about. And yet, for hundreds of years, it's been part of our lives. In its time, wallpaper has been anything but ordinary. It's been at the height of luxury. It's aroused disgust. It's caused moral outrage, and at one stage, it even threatened to poison us. The history of wallpaper is a much more eventful one than you might think. Only a handful of British designers and makers of wallpaper have become household names. Most have been unknown, but the patterns they created have had a deep effect on us. Whether it's made by hand, or by machine, wallpaper has broadcast our tastes and aspirations to the world. For all these reasons, wallpaper is more than just a background. It's part of the fabric of our lives. Most of what we know about early wallpaper has had to be discovered from pieces tucked away behind skirting boards, lost under floorboards and hidden in attics. The history of wallpaper has literally been pieced together from fragments. Now there's been an intriguing find in a National Trust property built in 1720 here on Northbrink in Wisbeach. The building's currently not much to look at. It's being restored which is how an important lost piece of wallpaper history has been revealed. So what are we looking at here? Well, this is an uh, amazingly rare survivor from the uh, 1720s when the, the house was built. Gosh, that yeah. little section. So the owner of this house back in 1720, when this was on the wall, would have been a wealthy merchant. But just to own the house, I think mm. you'd have to be mm. pretty wealthy. So that was the height of fashion then. Well, it certainly was in this household, wow. anyway. <laughs> Another little fragment has survived here, and it survived only because it was covered by a, a dado rail here. And a skirting there. And a skirting there. So is this quite rare? I, yeah. I, I got very excited when someone sent me a photograph and I saw it come up on the screen. I thought, that looks, that looks pretty good. I always refer to wallpaper that's been taken off the wall as dead wallpaper. Yeah. Um, well, this, this is live. It might not look live, but mm. uh, this is live wallpaper here, just hanging on. Andrew needs to remove this rare fragment from its vulnerable position so it can be preserved. He's been able to pinpoint its early 18th century date from the architectural context and the printing techniques. I was impressed with that. Well, 30 years training yeah. doesn't get you <laughs> any better than that. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. Now, having it off the wall in my hands, I can see the, the weight of the paper. It's quite a stout paper. And it really gives a, an idea of the order of, of printing. First, the pinky red would have been block printed, and then the white on top of that. And then the black outline from a wood block again mm -hmm. on top. And then finally, the, the areas of green would have been produced with the aid of a stencil and a brush. That's very good. And we've got some other pieces in the, in the cupboard which will then allow us to piece together the whole design, mm. even though we have a relatively small area um, in terms of paper. And um, I've had a go. This piece I'm holding in my hand is that little section there. The, f the floral design being the dominant feature, but then these two vase shapes. I can see and that. then I think that was probably re repeated from ceiling to floor. Isn't that nice? What a lovely pattern. So, available in your local wallpaper shop, perhaps in a few months' time. A piece of wallpaper from the early 18th century is a precious find. But the story of wallpaper in Britain begins even earlier, back in the 16th century. Simple black and white printed paper sheets were sold by stationers for lining boxes, like we might line drawers today. But at some point in the 1500s, people started taking them and sticking them to their walls. Anthony Wells Cole has studied some surviving examples. Here we have a, a single sheet decorative paper 
of a kind which was printed by stationers in black on white. As you can see, the pattern is complete on, a, uh, on the single paper sheet, um, but it's printed with a simple decorative border all the way around. And this is how you generally find them pasted inside document boxes. But you could actually, by trimming one side and uh, either top or bottom, um, then get the pattern to repeat both horizontally like that and vertically like that. The repeat works perfectly well. So this is really the moment at which these decorative papers first begin to be used for the decoration of something bigger than document boxes, i.e. hung on the walls of a house. In the late 17th century, these multi-purpose printed sheets grew in popularity, soon becoming specially made papers for walls, known as paper hangings. Most were designed to imitate textiles. The silk damasks, tapestries and embroideries hung on the walls of the rich, and they were bought by merchants keen to ape the decor of the aristocracy. By the 18th century, wallpaper was being made by specialist paper stainers. We don't know much about the people who practiced this trade, but they have left us with a few clues. Luckily enough, we do have a link to the wallpaper makers from the past through these trade cards, small advertising cards for wallpaper, and they give us a pretty good idea of the designs that were available and what inspired those designs. I particularly like this one because there's so much going on. This dates to 1715, a company based in London, the blue paper manufacturer, Abraham Price, the proprietor. Instantly it says, this is what's happening. This is the latest fashion. They could imitate anything from Irish stitch, flowered sprigs and branches, others yard wide in imitation of marble, fit for the hangings of parlours, dining rooms and staircases. It's got little images of the wallpaper actually being block printed. It's also got a suggestion of Irish stitch hanging down one side of this window and you could have wallpaper mimicking and imitating anything you wanted. So there you are, look, wallpaper is always trying to look like something else. But not all imitations were cheap. In the early 18th century, wallpaper began to go up market. The most prized wallpaper was flock, with a raised, furry design which looked like cloth. It was even considered suitable for the grandest of houses, like Clandon Park, built in the 1720s. These days, flock wallpaper tends to have a rather dubious reputation, but back in the early part of the 18th century, it was considered the most elite of wallpaper. Now, this room is a rare survival. This rich red flock was hung around 1730, and it survived because it was later hidden away under green silk hangings. Flock like this was designed to copy one of the most expensive wall decorations of the day, rich hangings of silk velvet. And it is surprisingly effective. And although flock is significantly cheaper than the rich silks it copied, nevertheless, it was considered grand enough for a baron to stick up on the walls. In fact, 18th century British-made flock wallpaper became the envy of the world. It was even exported to France, where it was so fashionable, people took down their priceless tapestries to put up flock wallpaper instead. This sudden elevation in status was made possible by one vital British innovation, a revolution in wallpaper printing, the roll. Alison McDermott is an expert in historic wallpaper who can show me how flock is made. It starts with putting the background colour on that all-important roll of paper. So we're going to have a go at making 18th century wallpaper. How was the paper originally joined together to make rolls? Well, it was just single sheets and of course when they first started using wallpapers in the 17th century they just applied it on the wall in sheets but as the patterns got bigger and bigger to imitate silks and damasks they came up with a clever idea of joining it which they would do by pasting up along there with animal glue mm -hmm. just overlapping. overlapping it like that and then pounding it and so when it's joined it looks something like that and there you go, a roll mm. of paper. Yes, exactly. Beautiful the gauge, the width, hasn't really changed that it much, hasn't. has it? It hasn't, and that's why it's 
very useful when you're trying to recreate a design from just little fragments that you found, because it was always 21 inches. So you've prepared this with a ground already, haven't you? There's one coat of distemper ground, mm -hmm. and this is a very complicated colour because you need to get a really, really rich red colour. Okay. So you have to lay four layers, starting with that, then we're going to do a rich terracotta, then we'll do two layers of crimson over the top of that. Wow. And then a crimson varnish. So you get so a you real really are sheen. Building up yes, a yes, foundation yes. before you can even start to print. Exactly. Yeah. Unusual looking brushes. Yes. We had them copied from 18th century designs for brushes. And they are super. They give a wonderful textural quality. Why, why are they round? Well, you will find out. OK, come on, then. <laughs> show me. <laughs> one, there for we are. Me. one for you. Do you want me to work in circles like this? Yes. or OK. Mm -hmm. You almost stroke it on. It's quite a sensual experience. OK. OK. Just keep grinding yep. in. Go for it. Very gently. Is the idea to lose the swirling lines? I don't stage? think so, no, because that's how it looked in the 18th century. So that's what we're trying to achieve, an authentic facsimile copy, mm. which has all those wonderful textural qualities sure, about sure. it. Sure, so it's historically correct. Exactly. Yeah. That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Because it's all about the amount of pressure that you put on, and if you can get it nice and even like that, that's really good. Is that okay? That's it. That's brilliant. You see the paper starting to undulate, yes, can't you? Yeah. So you can imagine how difficult it is to hang. Because mm. as soon as you wet the back and put paste on, it's all over the place. So yeah. it takes a real specialist to do it. I enjoyed that. <laughs> The wallpaper is printed using wooden blocks, with the pattern carved in relief. The great advantage of those long rolls of paper becomes clear at this stage. Rather than having to fit the whole repeat pattern onto a single sheet of paper, the patterns can be as long as you like, suitable for the grandest rooms. In this case, Alison's printer den is using two different blocks. Pop that one on there, and the other one goes on the line. OK. Take By carefully aligning them, the pattern could repeat seamlessly along the roll. We're using a special slow-drying paint, a vital ingredient for flock wallpaper. Not oh, bad at all. Quite a frightening process to start <laughs> with, isn't it? It is, absolutely terrifying. You're now painting in the bits that are missing. And the retouching, pigment. yes. Retouching. Yes. Back in the 18th century, this is exactly what would have happened. Yes, Once the yes, block was yes, printed, yeah, yeah. someone would be here. Yeah. Someone would be here touching it. Yeah. Are you going to be really, really fussy and do every single little hole, or yes. you do? Right, okay. <laughs> we do. Yes, we do. We like it to be perfect. What's going to happen to it now? Now we'll lift it very carefully and we'll take it into the flocking room. And of course, that has to be in a separate area because. The flock can get everywhere. Okay. We put it in a sealed box. In the 18th and early 19th century, it did get everywhere. Do we have to let that dry first? Nope. It no. goes in exactly Wet. as it is. The stickier, okay. the better. Right, OK. Thanks. Right, we'll pop it straight in the box. Okay. What's next, Alison? Ladle some of the flock on. This is just, what is this, chopped up wool? It is chopped up wool, exactly that. How do you chop that up so fine? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's very difficult to find anybody to do this anymore. And this particular batch was made by a completely mad friend of mine who used a very sharp rotary lawnmower, which he operated with a bicycle. Really? Mm. How was this traditionally done? That, sounds, <laughs> that does sound bonkers. They did have uh, flock cutting boxes with very sharp blades in, and they would chop away at it. So, so what do uh, I do? Sprinkle right, it on the very, top? Yes, just spread it over. In the 18th century, they would cut flock by hand, so it's very uneven and quite long, and it sort of gives a very hairy effect, which is very typical of the 18th century. 19th century flock tended to be ground in mills, so it's a much, much finer flock, and it's more like a sort of the effect of sand on the surface. Mm. Right, OK, next stage. OK. Lid down. Lid down. 
Did you make this up yourself? We did. <laughs> right, now, bang the bottom. After you. <laughs> should do it. Right. Can we open the box? We can open the box. I think that's fantastic. I think that's very good. It's stuck well. It's stuck well. Yes. It's stuck really well. <laughs> Are you happy with that? I am. I think that's pretty good. Picks up the light, doesn't it? It does, yes. Which, of course, was what it was intended to do. Sure, yeah. Because, of course, in the 18th century, it was designed to imitate silk damask. So you get that lovely shimmering effect. You get the matte effect of the flock and you get the sheen of the background. Yes, that's lovely. Well done. What a fascinating process. <laughs> The skill involved in making flock wallpaper ensured that it remained a desirable luxury. But in the middle of the 18th century, an exotic new introduction from China raised wallpaper to even greater heights. Chinese wallpaper was hand-painted in incredible detail, making each sheet a work of art. This example was presented to Thomas Coutts, owner of Coutts Bank, in 1794. Today, it's being restored, so it's possible to get a closer look. Chinese wallpaper was hand-painted with beautiful exotic scenes. Each sheet was different and incredibly detailed. This was an expensive luxury and it was hard to come by. Now, for the first time, we had a wallpaper that was treasured in its own right and not just an imitation of something else. And by the end of the 18th century, pretty much every great country house in Britain had a room full of Chinese wallpaper Wallpaper was no longer the poor relation. The British manufacturers were quick to respond. They produced their own printed Chinese designs, which took their place alongside the ever-growing range of wallpapers produced. Florals, geometric patterns, Gothic architecture, patterns imitating lace, striped silk dress fabrics, or designed to look like prints pasted to a wall. You might have thought that all this choice would have thrilled 18th century consumers, but for a growing middle class keen to get things right, it seems to have been a bit of a worry. Amanda Vickery has been studying a book of letters sent by customers to a London decorating firm called Trollope and Sons. What comes out of the letter books for me is this search for kind of safety and getting it right and, mm. you know, not getting it wrong. So there was a lot of social anxiety back then? Uh, definitely, but this is a letter which I think um, you get some little sense of that, the anxieties of the consumer and trying to winkle out of Trollope and co what they think would be the right thing to do. Mrs Burt of West Malling is asking for advice about the paper that she has put up. Mrs Burt does not know if the one she has chosen is very fashionable and begs Mr Trollope will send her word whether it is usual to cut out the borders as formerly or whether it is now the custom to leave the edge and for satisfaction whether it is tolerably new. So right, okay. so that's she, interesting. Yes, yeah, she wants his uh, reassurance, she wants to be told. I don't think she wants to be at the cutting edge of fashion. No. She doesn't want to be streaking ahead of the pack. She just wants to be in the ballpark. Safe. Yes. Comfortable. Safe, but fashionable. Sometimes when people talk about, you know, the consumer revolution of the 18th century, you get this idea of sort of unbridled shopping and hedonism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what I find is something much more uh, constipated, really, so much more rule bound and full of, you know, what is the right thing to do? Everyone who says I should have good taste, what on earth is good? good taste. Yes. Yeah, and so they right. are very preoccupied with that. Mm -hmm. This one, this is um, written in 1799, August 1799. And the person writing this letter has seen some wallpaper in the house of a friend. So it gives you this idea of sort of keeping up appearances. Sure, yeah. I saw the other day at our friend Mr. Pagoose some very pretty papers your man was putting up. So already he's glimpsed them yeah. on a visit. I'm in want of a paper for a very small room which must be papered immediately. 
I care nothing about fashion if they are neat and clean. Well, that's typical of a man, then, isn't it? Well, mm. I don't know. Does he really care? No Does he really care nothing about fashion? That's the question because they've seen something that he likes. Yes, and also neat and clean are themselves sort of concepts which are fashionable because neat in the late eighteenth century means a spare, pared down elegance. It means right. well put together, not showy. Okay. Not drawing attention to itself, but still chic. So if you think, where else are you going to get colour from? Mm. In, you know, in dank old Albion. Well, you know, this, <laughs> this would be it. And it's green, the they love green. Mm. Nobody would ever criticise you for green. In fact, there's, I have to say, in the Trollope letter books, green is the colour that's requested more than anything else. So I think a lot, you can unpack a whole world of taste mm. from a letter like that. So it's clear consumers worried about wallpaper being too gaudy, too fashionable, or not fashionable enough. But what were they actually choosing? This 19th century order book from Counten and Sons, beginning in 1824, is the earliest to provide samples of the wallpapers customers selected. Jill Saunders has been examining it. Page by page, you get details of the customer. For here, for example, we have Mr. William Smith of 13 Sussex Place, Regent's Park, and he is ordering a number of wallpapers on the 20th of May, 1825. Here is a rather attractive pink pattern, which he chose for a bedroom, and then a rather simpler pattern, little stars on a buff-coloured ground, which he ordered for a number of rooms just described here as attics. It's interesting that you do have this information, this indication um, quite often that a paper is chosen for a particular space. But sometimes the book confounds our expectations. The papers we expect for bedrooms, light colours, simple patterns, are not necessarily those which are chosen by the, uh, the people who ordered from Cowtown and Co. They're, they will often choose something which we would think quite unsuitable, something very boldly coloured, something with a large pattern. Even if the vagaries of taste mean what they chose isn't always what we might view as tasteful today, one thing Cowton's customers could be sure of was that they were decorating their walls luxuriously. Wallpaper was expensive. It was still made using wooden blocks, hand-printed onto paper rolls that had been glued together from individual sheets. But paper technology was changing. In the early 19th century, machines appeared that could make paper in long, continuous rolls. The old method of producing glued together rolls of paper had a tendency to stretch or break when it became wet with ink or paste. And now, for the first time, paper could be made in wallpaper-friendly lengths. It was the first step towards mechanisation. In 1839, a steam-powered wallpaper printing machine was patented. Amazingly, very similar techniques are still used today, without the steam. Carl Ashby wants to show me his surface print machine. These machines are credited with being invented around 1839 okay. and they went through a very slow sort of development process really up until about 1850, 1860 and then due to certain technical advances um, these machines suddenly blossomed into these wonderful full-on 12 colour, 18 colour, 20 colour machines. These particular machines date back to before 1920 um, and they're no different to um, to where they were in 1860, 1870. So just talk me briefly how the whole thing works. So this is the ink tray here. This is our water-based inks. It's picked up by this blanket here. That blanket could be a hard blanket, could be a soft blanket, and it will determine how much ink gets picked up. And then it will simply transfer it to the back of the print roller that sits against the paper that's on the outside of that large drum. It's almost like block printing on a machine and that's essentially what happened. They took a block printing process and they converted it to, to manufacturing. In the most sophisticated machines, up to 20 colours could be printed simultaneously. Each colour in its tray with its own blanket and roller, printing wet ink on wet ink. At any one time there's about 150 metres of paper, which is equivalent to about 15 rolls, and it takes it over the back of the machine through the grinding process before taking it back up into real form. How much can you print in a day here? 
Um, on one of these machines, these are, these are the, uh, essentially one of the slower processes, really. These machines produce around 250 rolls in an hour, so about 2,500 metres. And will these last now another 100 years? Have you seen the thickness of the steel? <laughs> yeah. um, they will, won't they? Yeah, we hope so, yeah. With mechanisation, suddenly wallpaper was available to all but the very poor. In 1834, just over a million rolls of wallpaper had been printed by hand. Ten years after mechanisation, Britain produced five and a half million rolls. And in 1874, 32 million rolls. A hand-printed paper might be 25 shillings a roll. Machine-made wallpaper costs as little as tuppence a roll. It was the age of cheap wallpaper. In Birmingham, there's a unique opportunity to see the paper ordinary households chose. These houses, built around a courtyard, are known as back-to-backs. From the middle of the 19th century, they were rented to craftsmen and their families, living in cramped conditions. As soon as wallpaper was cheaply available, it was used here, and layer upon layer has survived, up to 28 layers deep. I've come to meet the researcher who's been studying this wallpaper, Husnara Bibi. Back in 2002, when they started to restore the back-to-backs, the director of Birmingham Conservation Trust, she realised that there were a lot of layers of paper and there's something quite special. So she decided to rescue as many pieces as she could. So she just went round with a black bin bag and put in as much as she could. Was there a lot of wallpaper discovered? Initially, when it was catalogued, there were about 60 patterns that were recognised. But after that, I think I found 142. That's an awful lot of paper, considering there's only around, what, a dozen houses here? Yeah, 11 houses. The reason we think there were so many layers was because the walls were really in bad condition. So if anybody took down some of the paper, then all the plaster would probably come off. So people just preferred to paper over. Can we talk about some of the earliest wallpapers that you found? The earliest that we found is roughly 1850s, and this is an example of that paper. Um, you can see it would have been much brighter than this, obviously, sure. and because the paper's so cheap and there's a lot of acidity, it's browned over time. I like this particular pattern. What can you tell me about this? This was obviously a darker red in its day. Yeah, it's faded a lot. It's from around 1870, that piece of paper. It's in a layer of about 28, and that's the 23rd layer. Can you talk me through what you've got here, these smaller fragments? OK, these were all from the same house, from the same room and the same room. How many layers so, thick? So um, this one was about 21 layers thick, and we've taken them apart by soaking them in water. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, so that's, that's bright. It's quite a bold print there. We have a lot of fragments, but you can tell that they were really bold and bright mm. um, patterns. Because when you're actually standing in these rooms, there's not an awful lot of daylight that comes through your one window here, is there? Yeah, I mean, More another floral. reason why they probably be papering so often and with such bright colours is because of the dirt in the houses and the dirt from the industry and from the coal fires and oil lamps. Mm -hmm. The papers got so dirty so quickly, which is why they'd want to replace it with bold and bright patterns, which would take a little bit longer to age. For you, it's been like peeling back the layers of history, literally, hasn't it? It has. It's been really exciting to see what these working class people would have actually used because we don't see very often what the everyday people would have used as decoration. And how they expressed their surroundings with different colours and different patterns and how they wanted to be cheered up. Yeah, definitely. A lot of cheering up would need, needed when living in these houses. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to mechanisation, almost anyone could transform their environment with bright, colourful wallpaper. And in 1851, this newly revitalised industry had a chance to declare itself to the world at the Great Exhibition, a giant trade fair housed in the Crystal Palace. But what was supposed to be a showcase turned into a minor disaster. Despite Britain leading the world in machine-printed wallpaper, the exhibits failed to impress. There were many marvellous wallpapers printed with a number of colours using machine printing and they were marvellous technical achievements but many commentators and critics who visited the Great Exhibition were appalled by the aesthetic quality of these papers which tended to emphasise illusionistic patterns, pictorial patterns, trompe l'oeil and so on, patterns which really were, as they felt, unsuited to flat surfaces. 
Then something extraordinary happened. A government department weighed in on the debate. They were so worried about dodgy British design, they commissioned the Inspector General for Art to write an official report on wallpaper. The conclusion was that manufacturers of machine-made papers obsessed about technical details when they ought to be improving public taste. There was a growing feeling in the arts establishment that British design had lost its way. Something had to be done. Now, this piece of paper is evidence of one rather dramatic attempt to try and turn things around. It was part of an exhibition set up in 1852 titled False Principles of Design, and it was first shown at the Museum of Manufactures, which later became known as the Victoria and Albert Museum. And the idea was to try and show the British public examples of utterly indefensible design. Bad taste, if you like. And the exhibition featured a great deal of wallpaper. So what did they think was wrong with this example? Well, pretty much everything. For a start, it features objects inappropriate for a wall. Whoever saw a railway station on a wall, after all? The other exhibits showed similar flaws. Even this special Crystal Palace wallpaper shown at the Great Exhibition itself. Too much realism, perspective and shading. Realistic floral motifs came in for criticism and imitations of fabric or stone were seen as deceitful. The leading inspiration behind the reformer's ideas was Augustus Pugin, one of the architects of the Houses of Parliament. Pugin was at the forefront of Victorian Gothic revival, but he was horrified by what passed for Gothic wallpaper. Realistic architectural features arches and pinnacles stacked one on top of the other. Pugin thought this was absolutely dreadful. It was a falsification, of course, of the idea of a flat pattern for a flat surface. And so uh, in his own designs, he reacts very much against that kind of pictorial design, using these flat geometric or heraldic motifs and flat areas of colour. Pugin's cutting-edge ideas were brought right to the heart of government when he set to work on the interiors of the Palace of Westminster in 1844. The dramatic Gothic decoration left nothing to chance, every detail according to his vision. This book is a wonderful treasure because it contains these small samples of almost all the papers that Pugin designed for the Palace of Westminster. Here he is true to his principles, using flat colours, simple motifs, but also occasionally elaborate papers using gold and coloured flock. Here we have um, one paper with red flock and another with red and green flock. 100 different wallpaper designs were created to adorn formal spaces, committee rooms and even private apartments. Many of Pugin's original wallpapers were lost in the years to follow. But by the end of the 20th century, people were taking a great interest in recreating Pugin's interiors. And a remarkable discovery was made. The wallpaper firm Cole & Son had amassed a collection of thousands of wood blocks from many different firms. And among them, Pugin's original wallpaper blocks still survived. So today, it's possible to recreate many of Pugin's designs exactly using the original blocks. I'm going to get to print a Pugin wallpaper myself with the help of printer Den Condon. What do I do? If you just put your hand in from here. Yeah. Like that. Bring it round. And okay. ink it up. Like that. What's underneath here? That's felt, is it? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a felt blanket, which yeah. gives a nice even bed for the paint. That's it. Just press and down. Push down. Not, Not only are the blocks original, the printing table itself replicates a 19th century setup out. with its counterweight to help with the heavy lifting. You want that little dot there? Got it. Bring the one the other side. Yeah, got it. There. You can bring the arm over. What does this do then? Gives you a lot more pressure. Okay. That's it. 
it straight up. Straight up? Straight up. There we are. Oh, that's not bad, is it? That's not bad at all. That's, that's not very bad. Good. I'm happy yeah. with that. And that's a good example of Pugin's work, isn't it? That, that design. Yes. Simple, flat, two-dimensional pattern designed to look good on a flat piece of paper. But look at that for a lovely old block. It's splitting in places, but that's, you know, given its age and the fact that it's splitting with the grain, it's been screwed together in places to tighten it's it up. It's not doing bad. It still looks fashionable today, doesn't it? I mean, what we've just it still done. It's as good today as it did when it was first done. Pugin's wallpaper designs were considered too large and too bold for most domestic settings, but his approach was eagerly taken up by later generations of designers. In fact, the aesthetic of flat pattern, prizing workmanship and design over mechanical detail was at the heart of what would become known as the arts and crafts movement. At the forefront of this design revolution was William Morris, and it was his wallpaper that spread his influence into many middle-class homes. Which brings me to 18 Stafford Terrace, home of punch cartoonist Edward Lindley Sanborn. In 1871, he set out to decorate this place with the latest fashions in artistic taste. When it comes to wallpaper, only one man would do, William Morris. There's an infantry that belongs to this house, dating from 1877. It records Messrs Morris and Co supplying wallpapers to the entire house at a cost of 35 pounds and five shillings. Now here, in the morning room, the papers they chose were William Morris's most popular design, the pomegranate pattern. And it's not just on the walls, it's on the ceilings too. The fact that the original wallpaper is still here is testament to the success of Morris's designs. His dense, stylized patterns, based on nature, have been barely out of production since they were first made. And the craft element has remained vital. No machinery here. Morris's designs were block printed and expensive. But the owner of this house had fickle tastes, which meant sometimes even the William Morris had to go. Up in the drawing room, the most important room in the house, Lindley Sanborn's eye was caught by a new trend. Now here's a good example of Edward Lindley Sanborn's desire to keep his walls looking impressive. He did change things a bit, and he seemed to think this drawing room needed updating. So in 1884, he installed this gilded embossed leather imported from Japan. Now he wasn't a prolific spender. He only just bought enough, and I mean just enough. He had it carefully installed around all the pictures and mirrors. And I can show you, if I do this, look at that, underneath some William Morris wallpaper, the Larkspur design, pasted up in 1871. The occasional whim of fashion aside, Morris's designs won over the artistic middle classes. But despite the desire of Morris and other wallpaper designers to improve the aesthetic health of the nation, many people were more worried about how wallpaper might affect their physical health. Manufacturers had been experimenting with new chemical dyes and pigments, which could be rather frightening something that paper conservator Susan Catcher still has to worry about. I presume I can get a little closer now. I presume you can. Let me just take this off. Oh. Was something quite dangerous going on there? The green on this wallpaper contains arsenic, and so consequently it's a known carcinogen, and because this has actually had to be humidified for me to be able to consolidate it, of course the, we've had the vapour. There was a certain amount of public outrage in the 1850s and 60s. <laughs> People assumed they were going to die if they put this wallpaper on the wall, or they were instantly going to fall over. <laughs> I don't think you dropped dead, not immediately. I think it took a little longer than that. Um, there has to be other conditions um, involved, a dampness being mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. and then the damp allowed a mould to feed off the um, wallpaper paste that was, that was actually holding the wallpaper up. Right. And so, you know, the, that in conjunction... Caused with, the gases caused to the escape. Caused the gases to, to, to vaporise, mm. yeah. By the time we got to about 1870, the British Medical Journal was already highlighting the fact that there were problems to do with um, arsenic coming mm, out of wallpaper mm. and killing children. Mm. 
Because it was in their nurseries. Green because it was, was a green color. was a very popular color. It, well, it, because it was bright, it didn't sort of define gender. And the color was, of course, you know, beautiful, beautiful emerald green yeah. and um, vibrant, it, very strong. vibrant. Yeah, strong. strong. Still yeah. is today, look. Yes, yes, and I mean that was the beauty of, of the of the pigment was that it was very very stable. And arsenic mm. green is very stable pigment mm. until, of course, it starts getting mould and damp. Then it doesn't become so stable. You know, you have the famous story about Napoleon Bonaparte, exactly, of course, yes, yes, and yeah. he died of stomach cancer. Stomach cancer, wasn't but it? But was it, that it was assumed? It was yeah, the green well, wallpaper I mean, it was very damp. Yes, you know, it was. I'm sure that um, mm. they they found mould as well, and I, you know, maybe that was you know sort of made worse. But but even today, as you can see, you know, we're yeah. having to we're yeah. having to treat it. So, so what happens to this now? That's being sealed once again. It's not being sealed. It's actually because the pigment is actually is very very flaky. Okay. And rather than actually losing it, because that's what will happen. This is fixing it down. This is fixing it down, yes. So what I'm doing is the droplets are just going under the flakes a little bit just and just to, holding just, hold just holding it down. it down, yeah. I don't want to lose what we've what we've no. we've already lost quite a lot. Yes. So, so did the manufacturers start to advertise arsenic-free wallpaper? <laughs> William, <laughs> William Morris did. Yes, he did. Uh, he, um, I think he was jumping a bit on the bandwagon as well. But mm. we have tested his arsenic-free wallpapers, <laughs> and I have to say they yes. are. But I don't know whether all his competitors' wallpapers okay. that can actually be said to be arsenic-free. Even when it was arsenic-free, wallpaper was losing its cosy reputation. Once seen as the only way to a clean and fresh house, Wallpaper was becoming suspect, a magnet for dirt, insects, mould, even infection. What people wanted was washable wallpaper. And in the 1870s, the introduction of oil-based printing inks made this a reality. Christine Woods has made a special study of these so-called sanitary wallpapers. Well, this is one of five wallpaper pattern books that were discovered in the attic of a house in Leeds. This book dates from 1895, and yet it's rare, and as you can see, falling to pieces. And on the top, we have a sanitary wallpaper, and the interesting thing about them is that the design is not made up of solid color. The rollers are different to the rollers used on a, a normal machine printing machine. And they have an etched design, and the design is made up of tiny, tiny etched holes. So the color goes into the holes, sucked into the holes, and then it's transferred onto the paper. But however much you put your holes close together, you're never going to have a completely solid color. It's going to be made up of tiny, tiny dots. So I think a lot of authorities on design felt that they were really rather dull, rather dreary. But quite often, manufacturers who criticised them were actually producing them, and producing them in their hundreds. Um, because, of course, they were bread and butter. They were keeping the industry going. And I think they're wonderful. I mean, some of the drawing is just beautiful. So I think we have to just bring them to the fore a bit. I think they've been neglected. But some problems couldn't be cleaned away. Late 19th century writers worried that wallpaper might also send you mad. With the range of patterns available, like this Victorian imitation marble, it's perhaps not surprising. Mrs Beaton even specified that in bedrooms, certain patterns should be avoided, ones that might allow an invalid to imagine monsters and demons. Despite all this, wallpaper was everywhere. As the 20th century dawned, this produced a reaction. The Oxford English Dictionary could soon include another meaning for wallpaper. A distasteful background, from repetitive music to pointless images. And for the first time, wallpaper's dominance was threatened by paint. A new generation of architects didn't like patterned walls. In fact, they despised them. What they wanted was the purity of plain, white, painted walls. The modernist architect Le Corbusier denounced pattern walls as encouraging accretions of dead things from the past that were intolerable and staining. 
So in the 1930s, the design elite reached not for expensive wallpaper, but for the paintbrush. To make matters even worse, the Second World War put a stop to wallpaper manufacture entirely. People were even encouraged to donate their wallpaper to the war effort. Every scrap of paper that you put out for salvage helps to hang the paper hanger. When it's been made into shell cases, gear wheels, aeroplane parts, cartridge wads and other articles of war. So don't just bring out the paper you see lying about. Ransack your house. Paper can help to hang the paper hanger. But after the war, wallpaper came back with a vengeance. It was partly thanks to the introduction of screen printing, forcing ink through a stencil on fine woven mesh. New techniques had a big effect on wallpaper in the 1950s. Screen printing setups like this one meant that wallpaper could be printed in huge repeats. And because making a screen is considerably cheaper than carving a set of rollers, you could have short print runs with striking avant-garde designs. Wallpaper became fashionable again, shaking off the disapproval of the modernists. One of the most innovative ranges in the period was called Palladio, a hugely influential set of screen-printed designs aimed at architects and interior designers. Many of the Palladio papers were designed by people who were new to wallpaper design. They were often artists or illustrators or designers in some other field. And this was one of the key ways in which the trade revitalised their business by, by introducing new ideas and new blood. This pattern, I think, is very distinctively 1950s. It's called Malaga. And of course, this is uh, the time when people are starting to go, certainly the middle classes are starting to go to places like Spain for their holidays, and they're uh, reading Elizabeth David's cookery books. Here's another paper inspired by holidays. This one is called um, Bistro. <laughs> As we've seen, so many wallpapers took their inspiration from textiles, but here in the 1950s, that idea is being reinvented. So you're getting a sort of abstract pattern based on a woven textile. This particular pattern is actually called weft. This is colonnade. Again, this, it's been so much reproduced in books, it's hard to know whether it was actually popular at the time or whether <laughs> everyone just loves it ever since. Designs by the likes of Lucien Day and John Minton set the tone for an art-led transformation of wallpaper. By the end of the 1950s, consumers were more and more drawn to modern design, and the wallpaper trade was booming. There's one place where you can really get a sense of the wallpapers ordinary buyers were choosing. This hardware shop in East London has been selling wallpaper since the Edwardian era. After the paper shortages of World War II, the owners started to hoard wallpaper and it became a habit. Today, it's an Aladdin's cave of old wallpaper from the post-war years. Forward-looking design in wallpaper continued right into the 1960s, influenced by youth culture and psychedelia. And here is a very good example of the patterns you'd find in the 1960s. Look at that. Bright, happy colours. That really is the swinging 60s. New techniques in printing allowed almost photographic imitations of stone and wood. And some good examples are something like this. Look at that. Here's a roll of cork. <laughs> Instead of putting cork tiles on the wall, you could have a roll of paper imitating cork tiles. Manufacturers also came up with the ultimate washable papers, vinyl, and also we've got metallic foil-backed papers. Look at that. Good quality. That would look good on the wall today. That's an expensive paper. Self-adhesive one as well. But in the 1970s, with the wallpaper industry at its very height, Living spaces were dominated with bold geometric patterns like this one. And I can remember my parents' dining room with patterns like that, sitting around the G-plan furniture. Very happy days. And this, this is exactly 
what we had in our bathroom. Look at that. And we even had a matching bath suite as well. It was called Sun King Yellow. It was disgusting, but I absolutely loved that wallpaper in our loo in our bathroom. That was my mum and dad being bold. <laughs> Not that this was to everyone's taste. A long way from the mass-produced brightness, the British tradition of handmade wallpapers had lingered on. Before the war, artist Edward Borden had been its leading champion. Now there was a revival of interest in craft. William Morris made a comeback, and designer makers created new work. Martha Armitage has been hand-printing her wallpaper designs from lino cuts since the 1960s. It's magical seeing the whole process come alive in a matter of seconds. Well, this is the fascination about printing, is the colour goes down all at once. Mm -hmm. If you're painting, of course, it's bit by bit, but, but with printing, and there's something magical about yeah, it. Yeah, see, seeing, that, seeing that process evolve just instantly like that. Yeah. How many rolls of paper could you print a day? A roll is, is 10 metres, and we, we can't really print more than six. Okay. In a day. Six rolls. Yeah. Yeah, that's still a lot of work. Do you always use lino? Always use lino, yes. The other, only other thing you could do for block printing is, is wood blocks. Yeah. But um, you find it easier to cut in lino. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I would. <laughs> You're surrounded by all your work here. And I can see you go for soft muted tones. Yes, I don't like um, bright colours mm. on. Because I do think wallpaper is a background, should be a background. Mm -hmm. When did the interest in wallpaper start with you? Well, we, <laughs> we needed some wallpaper in our house because it was scruffy. <laughs> <laughs> and we couldn't afford wallpaper, but, and so I suddenly thought I'd done a bit of lino cutting at school. And um, I thought if you made a nice big block, mm -hmm. you could print your own paper. Would you like to see the first one I did? Oh, yes, please. And that's the very first example. Mm. So how did you go about doing that? I didn't think very hard about the size of the block. And I just, I'd had done a drawing and then I put it onto the lino. Mm -hmm. And then I printed it on the floor, put mm. the paper on the floor and then and the on block it. on top. And stood on the block to get the pressure. And it developed from there. I mean, you've inspired me to have a go. I, I, I'd like to have a go at turning the handle. Okay. There might be a few imperfections coming up. I tell you what, you ink up. Yep. And I'll do this bit. Just gently? Gently, and don't park anywhere. OK, just go right to the end? Yes. OK. Oh, I like that word, park. <laughs> oh. <laughs> how, did, how did we do? That's not too bad, is it? No, that's quite good. Very good. Do you regard that as a work of art? Because I do. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> I it, do. What is art? <laughs> yeah, that's art. That's art for stars. I suppose it is, yeah. Meanwhile, the world of commercial wallpaper started to lose its way in the last years of the 20th century. In the 1990s, plain walls would finally conquer the ordinary home. Advertisers made very clear the prevailing view of flowery wallpaper, as those feisty 90s ladies were encouraged to chuck out their chins. But then wallpaper started sneaking back, with special statement designs for single walls, feature wallpaper, Today, in the 21st century, things are once again going wallpaper's way. Well, it seems wallpaper has made a bit of a comeback. It's been on the rise for the last 10 years, starting with one feature wall in the room and then spreading to the rest of the walls. 
And technology is changing too. There's a sort of revolution going on. A minor revolution, maybe. We, well, it's too soon to say. Similar to that which happened in the 19th century with the introduction of mechanisation. What we have now is the introduction of digital. Digital printing means new designers can produce their wallpaper instantly. No rollers, no blocks, no screens required. Giving a new freedom to experiment. It allows designers like Paul Simmons to create surprising new wallpapers. What was the inspiration behind this? Well, one of the things that we're known for is our reinterpretation of the old Toile de Jouy. Mm -hmm. They're late 18th century textiles. You know, with these, they're just interpretations of different cities, this one being London, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we're really, really telling a story about the city as it is right now. So we've got the Shard and, you know, um, we've got the Gherkin here. Yeah. And uh, we've got some of the rioting that happened last summer. Is this a popular one? You know, it actually is, um, apart from in uh, children's bedrooms. It's a kind of X-rated, X-rated paper, X-rated toile. <laughs> what about tastes? What's, uh, what's, what's particularly the most popular here? What do people actually focus on? They gravitate towards something, I would imagine. Well, actually, this one's been really popular. With this sort of design, um, it's got a classic feel. There's a lot of work that's gone into it, and I think there's something rewarding about looking at things that do have a lot of time that's been spent on it, you know, on it. And, you know, there's, there's layers of different repeats in, in the design that kind of builds it up and makes it sort of have that really rich sort of feel. How much would that retail at? This would retail at uh, £300 a roll. Um, and you probably, you know, for your average wall, you probably need about three rolls. But actually, when you think about it, you know, if you buy a painting, you're not going to get, you know, no. much change out of, I don't know. I don't know how much our paintings these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that going in most people's houses. This, on the other hand. Uh, yeah, well, this is, this is a sort of country pile meets um, yeah. bedsit, mm -hmm. you know, so you have this... The That's idea quite of, organic, though, when you see it. It's quite organic, right? but it's based on sort of stains and, and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and something kind of... Uh, the stains you know, of a bedsit. The stains of a bedsit, <laughs> but actually trying to make it really rich as well. What does the future hold? In terms of uh, technology, the quality of digital now is really changing things. Um, but I think it's going to be a combination of digital and hand print. There's loads of things that digital still can't do. You can't print varnishes, you can't print metallics. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a quality of the feeling, the actual ink on the paper as well with, with hand print. So I think the, the future is going to be mixing those things together. So sort of high and low tech. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's where the most interesting things are going to be happening. So the future's bright. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of exciting new wallpaper out there, drawing on every possible printing technique. And from independent boutiques to DIY superstores, the choice is huge. Well, it's clear that wallpaper is enjoying a revival. And I know we've been there before. Wallpaper has had its ups and downs, but this time, it feels different. There's a confidence about our choice today. We're not so hung up about the do's and the don'ts and the rigid rules of style. It doesn't matter. We can mix and match. Historical designs from the past with new innovations, handmade with digital. For me, wallpaper is here to stay for a lot longer.